Hi, everyone. Welcome again to today's uh, Intro to Programming webcast. My name is Mark, and to my left is... My name is Jonah. My coach is here at Udacity. Hi. Hope everyone's doing well this uh, today, this uh, in August month. So hopefully for some of you, it's sunny weather. I know it's sunny weather here in yeah. California. It was raining in LA. It was raining in LA. LA. It's pretty crazy. It, it, there was flooding. So <laughs> hopefully we could get more rain, but not in the flooding kind in more in California. So today we're going to be talking about the topic of planning an entire website from front to back. And this is a more higher level uh, of presentation. We're not going to dive too much into code, not too much into implementation of this code, because that, that deserves a whole lecture, or even a whole series of lectures in itself. What we're going to do is we're going to give you an overall uh, uh, overall overview of the lay of the land, like the forest. We're going to show you the bigger picture of how you start uh, thinking about a website and what are the things that you need, you need to think about and um, plan for. It. So, and these are the three things that we're going to be um, really learning is that when you walk away from this presentation, you're going to learn the crucial components that make up a website. And then you'll be able to answer the big questions involved in planning out a website. You're going to know the technologies required in order to deliver content to the internet user, and you'll be able to know how to research what technology you need to implement after this presentation. So basically, it's after this presentation, you'll be able to walk away knowing you know, on, on a good general level of what needs to get done. And you, you may not, you yourself as a programmer, you may not know everything that you need to do, but you at least know what needs to get done, and then you'll be able to research get help, hire someone, um, contract out some work, and you'll be able to at least know uh, at the minimum, you know, when you're talking with another programmer, uh, you could talk with them and relate to them, like, what, yeah. what you need to do. That's really half the battle is, like, knowing what you need to do. It's like once you have an idea of everything you need to do and the steps to do it, executing is not nearly as hard as figuring all that out. Um, so making sure that you have this framework set up beforehand makes life a lot easier later on. I totally agree. Yeah. And I would t dare say 90% of a programmer's job is just research. Yeah. You're just researching. You're just figuring out how to orchestrate and put things together. Um, before we uh, start even further, let's, we have a couple of questions. Yeah. So let's, let's just take a look at answer them. Um, let's come, let's oh. answer Brandon's. Brandon Hastings has an interesting question. Uh, will it be possible to get this? We're recorded, um, and yes, we are currently recording. Um, if you're watching it right now, you probably it's recorded, most likely. So uh, it will be on the Google Plus page, and you can access it at any time. It also will be put on the course later at some date, and then there's a whole list of them, um, a link to which will be on the Google Plus page. Yeah, and also we'll post our transcripts and our notes in the discussion forums as well. So there's there will be plenty of ways for you to access this video recording. Yeah. Um, and then we have another interesting question, a uh, very practical question from Kam Su Chang. Uh, and they ask, in general, which job is more highly paid, front-end developer or back-end developer? That's, that's a, <laughs> that, that's, you can't really ans answer that question because yeah. it, it's tough. It, there's so many other variables just because you're think you, you have a skill set in front-end technology or back-end te technology because it depends on how good you are as a person. <laughs> Depends on how much you know, and depends on what's important for the current company right now. Yeah. If they have an army of backend engineers, well, and if they only have one, and they need one lead front end engineer, you may have a more valuable, your position may be more valuable. Yeah. Versus vice versa. So, and also depends on your region too, yeah. where you live, the industry that you you're talking about. If you're talking about, you know. Corporations who need a Java backend developer, you know, they may pay a little more. But then, mm -hmm. if you're um, if you work in a startup, they may pay in equity. They they, they may pay in stock options. Yeah. So, there it's it's a um, it's it really depends. And there was there is no answer to this question. It's it's tough, and I think that if you're trying to decide between being front end and back end, hopefully this presentation should actually help you since we're going to cover both sides and maybe yeah. you can look in and be like, oh, I'm a little bit better at designing things and understanding how uh, 
how uh, users interact with things. Or maybe you're like, oh, I'm a lot better at understanding databases and how things connect together. Then in that case, you'd probably want to be a back-end engineer. So this will probably, this might help you uh, think about which path you want to go down. Yeah, and I like, uh, Jonah, I like your comment of like choosing what you like and what you're good at. Yeah. And nat your natural ten what's your natural tendency? And, and honestly, at the end of the day, you you, you work up to the uh, the and you gain enough expertise that it's more about like l liking your job yeah. and liking what you do versus just getting paid. Yeah, exactly. Just and being good at it. If you like it yeah. and you're good at it, you'll probably be paid. The the money will follow. Yeah. Honestly, like if you're lucky and you're really good at it, it the money will just follow. Yeah. But it shouldn't be just about purely money. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's move on. Cool. All right, so can you screen share? Yeah, uh, you're live. All right, I'm live. Uh, so we're gonna use Prezi to present, and yeah. So let's just get started. Planning a website from front to back. Understanding understanding the big questions to help you plan your website. And the first thing we need to actually really align everyone on, I think, is to make sure that, OK, let's align everyone and ask ourselves, what is a website? Good question. Well, what, what, what really is a website, Jonah? So like, for most people, a lot of people think, oh, a website is just a page of information. There's pictures and there's text. Yep. I just put uh, a URL, like um, you know, I go to Google.com, I go to Yahoo.com, NewYorkTimes.com, mm -hmm. to get information, and it did, and match. You know, there's a lot of magic. Magic happens, and I get information. Yeah, it's like my universal library, right? So uh, that's what a lot of people think about. I mean, back in the '90s, that's what it was. Like. No, what it was it was just yeah. just a way for us to access the information yeah. from the library. But you know, the web, the internet has evolved so much that it's more than just static pages now. And I, I would, I would uh, like to, you know, talk line with everyone about the definition of a website and really the definition that I think this is for me as a from a programming side, right? Not not just like a normal user, but it's like it's a framework for delivering content, yeah. whatever we want to deliver, music, videos, news. Whatever it is, whatever information is, it's a framework. Yeah. It is a system. It's a system made of a series of small little, you know, components that uh, deliver this content to our users. Mm -hmm. And that's really I want to line everyone on about this definition of a website because it makes it easy for us to understand the components of a website, and in therefore it makes us understand the variables that's involved in planning on making a website because in the end. We are orchestrating. We are. You could think of us as orchestrators. We're here to orchestrate and also, um, in basically link small little components together that deliver our website. Oh, let's see. Oops. Let's go back here. Yeah, and the and like I'll just like tell you right now. Like, what are the crucial components of a website? And these are the things that come off the top of my head. Really, these are the main basic components like HTML, CSS, user design, JavaScript, web server administration, databases, caching, server endpoints. These are all the big comp big time components that you uh, want to think about when you're designing a website. And these are the components that actually make up that help you deliver the content over a website. And really, it's there's a lot of components. And it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. And to help us as programmers to, to categorize and figure out, OK, how to organize our disinformation, we often tend to put these components into two categories, the front end and the back end. And this is, will be the most common terminology that you will ever hear in your programming, your web development program career, even programmers in general, the front end and the back end. And the front end really involves uh, the case of anything that the user sees, the browser, the design of the page, the JavaScripting of the page, anything that the user sees in the browser. That's front end design. Like all those components, such, such as HTML, CSS, user, user design, that's front, front end um, development. Now, there's another side called the back end, and that's where no one sees. 
no one really, like the, your users, they don't really see that. They don't really see the servers and the computers that's actually pushing this information and delivering this content to your, your users. Because for a backend development, it's all about making that the servers are running correctly. The servers can actually deliver content to your uh, browser, to the front end. Yeah. The back end could access the database and make sure that it uh, returns uh, the appropriate request that the front end or the user will have towards our um, our server. So basically, that's that's really two thing, two co two categories that you really need to think about in a nutshell: is the front end and the back end. So let's see. And now we're gonna move on to the front end. And Jonah, you're gonna you're I'm going to let Jonah to uh, explain more about yeah. the front end and all the components that we should think about. Yeah, absolutely. So front end is usually what, you know, as Mark said, the first thing that you see when you land on a website. And as such, it's also one of the first things you want to start thinking about when you're planning your website. It's the most visual component. And uh, it's where everyone's familiar with like uh, is design when they communicate with your website it's always through the front end. So you want to make sure it's clean, it's well designed, and everything works um, from the user's perspective. So the questions you want to think about are, how are we going to lay it out? Where are the images going to be? Where is the text going to be? Um, how, is, uh, how is everything going to be laid out, basically? Um, another thing you want to think about is what sort of content. So. If you have like a news site, you want to think about, OK, I want to put articles in, I want to put videos in, and I want to put maybe user responses in. Um, and then another thing you want to think about is how is the user going to interact with this page? So if it's Facebook, you know, the user is going to log in. They're going to comment on their friends' posts. They're going to like somebody's pictures. That's what we think about when we talk about user flow and interaction. And then the last component. I don't want to say last, because it's definitely very important, is the color and graphic design. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why, why that's important later. So one of the most important tools that you want to start with before you do anything um, is these two. These two things, pen, paper. Um, you, know, you can do it on your computer. You can design things. But I find it's really easy to get distracted on my computer at this stage. So it's best sometimes to just grab a piece of blank paper and start drawing things. And when I talk about drawing things, I mean drawing boxes. So you talked earlier about how HTML is all made up of boxes. They're nested boxes. Um, but everything's laid out in these, these square things. So what I have here, Mark, if you could go next. Um, mm, is it, it, yeah, oh, there it is. OK, cool. So let's look at the New York Times. This is an average website. You'll go to it, and it looks cool. You have some information. But if you look a little bit deeper, you can see that it's actually made up of boxes like everything else. Um, and I use this tool called Wireify to make this all together. So you'll see that the header here is a box. The video on the front page is a box. The article title is a box. And it's all laid out in this fashion so that it's easy for us to think about things abstractly. Because it's easy to get caught up in the small details when you're planning a website. So you want to start big scale. Where do I put things? And then once, um, once you have these things, you want to think about what goes in each of these boxes. So the top is probably the most important thing that the user is going to look at. Um, and so we put the header there, like the New York Times. Maybe you could scroll next. Yeah. yeah. So I put the header there. And then the next thing that's probably you're going to look at is the thing right in the middle of the page. That's going to be like your video or something. Uh, and next, you're going to think about where you're going to put your article. So uh, it's important to think about where the user is going to look when he or she lands on your page. And this is sort of part of the visual flow. Um, and you want to think about putting the important parts central, and then auxiliary parts on the side. So you notice that New York Times does this really well. And it's actually based really closely on um, the actual New York Times newspaper. Um, and that's not just because they're trying to emulate print media. It's People have thought about this before. And web design sort of has followed in the footsteps of print design to some extent. So it's important to think about 
how you can relate to print design when you're designing a web page. Um, and New York Times, I think, is a great example of this. Um, so let's see. Let's, let's Next yeah, so posts. when you have a little bit more complex things like popular posts, this isn't something that you can just put on your page. So you have to start thinking about what each box is going to do in terms of the back end. So you can see that we're already starting to transition from the front end to the back end at this point. Uh, and you have to think about what sort of code each element is going to use. Um, so I put in HTML5 for the video right there. And that's, that's my, that might be a way that you can put in a video into your page. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw around some terms here that you might not be familiar with, um, but it, you, you'll learn them as you go through. Um, and we're just sort of thinking about things in a higher level right now. Um, and if we look at popular posts, you can't just write out the post and expect it to refresh automatically. It's going to have to connect to a database in the background. So as you go through, make notes and be like, OK, I have this popular posts box on the right. I'm going to have to have it connect to a database later on. Um, and I should start thinking about how I want to do that. And then as far as user interaction, uh, you want to put like a login box, um, maybe somewhere where the user is going to see it quickly. So the top right is a great place that the New York Times puts it. And then you want to think about also, what sort of code is this going to use? It's probably use some JavaScript, some CSS. And then you, you want to keep this in mind as you're planning these things. Um, cool. So the wireframing stage is really useful for thinking about colors. You'll see that right now everything's in grayscale. And as you're writing out these boxes, you can put things in different shades as you put them in. So lighter shades will be lighter colors. Darker shades will be darker colors. And you might not think that colors are that important going into your page. It's like, oh, it's just cosmetic. but the colors and the layout and the graphic design and everything is very important uh, when you're looking at a page. Uh, when I land on a page that's not that important and there's bad graphic design, I want to leave it. Um, so if you have, like, I, if you ran into this, yeah, Mark, true. yeah, yeah, there are some sites where the colors are just awful. Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, Companies spend millions of dollars sometimes uh, redesigning their websites. Yahoo has gone through it. Spotify just did a redesign. Um, you know, it's best to start with a good design so that you don't have to go back and redesign everything. Um, and it makes the navigation easier. It'll make your website more pleasant to use. And it'll make it more likely that people will come back and use it later, which is really just the goal in the end. Um, so as I said, you can shade things to make sure that the contrast is good. Um, a good rule is to group things that are similar shaded with each other. So you'll have dark things on the right, as you see, and then um, a gray thing in the middle, and then dark thing at the top. And contrast is good. It'll draw your, your eye to it, but you don't want to overuse contrast. Um, yeah, so once you have this all laid out, you're basically done with your wireframe. You can sort of see how this comes together in a neat way. Uh, and at this point, you have to think about whether you want to design things yourself or outsource it. Um, because it can take a lot of time to do it yourself. So it might be more valuable to ask somebody else who's better at graphic design. Or you might be more personally invested in, in your product, so you want to design it yourself. Um, have you run into like having to? Delegate things and doing sites, or yeah, I'm the person who actually like likes to do everything in house. Yeah, so you'll f sometimes fire see me fire up Adobe Illustrator cool. or to actually design a logo or just right create my own graphics. But yeah, absolutely. for the most part, for me, yeah, yeah, I like complete control over my own website. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, that's that's cool. Um, and uh, if you want to have control over it, that's that's a crucial thing for a lot of people. And then other people, maybe their their time, they want to spend it more on making sure the the back end works. Um, so that's that's sort of uh, about as much as you can do in the front end stage. Um, and this will set you up really well to do more things later on. Um, so something else that is pretty important in front end planning is thinking about what sort of frameworks you want to use. 
So you can build a site from scratch. You know, you can build like the New York Times just by coding yourself, doing every single line, or make Reddit. But there are these things called software frameworks. And it really helps us to speed up the development process. Basically, it takes all the things that other people have used before and puts it into a prepackaged set of, uh, of code. So CSS, we have frameworks like Bootstrap, um, Pure CSS, and Cascade. And these are sort of like mm, prepackaged. Mm, I don't know, what are, what are some examples of things that frameworks can give you, like login buttons? Login buttons, color schemes, color schemes grid yeah. layouts. That's a big thing. Grid, yeah. Sure. Responsible with design, too, as well. Definitely. It's all like the, the, for like the, the breakpoints for like your phone, tablet, and desktop. Yeah. It's all programmed in for you. Yeah, great. So Mark made a really good point there about um, mobile design. So. When you're programming something on your computer, it's easy to just get caught up in programming things just for the computer. But using these frameworks like Bootstrap uh, help you to think ahead about making your website look good on a phone or a tablet, which is going to be huge in the coming years. And it's already huge right now. So yeah, I actually rec recommend if you're starting off your career you know, doing front end stuff, like after this now degree, you may want to create your own personal website, I really recommend you just start off mobile first. Yeah, and that, that, that's actually a big mantra right now in the front end web development community. So we're, we're telling you right now, it's all about mobile first design. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to design to design my own personal site. Cool. And it's mobile first. Yeah, I'm actually, nice. I should have a, I'm actually starting with like the, the width for, width and height for an iPhone 4. Okay. And I just want to say, okay, how does this look on a phone? I'll start there, and then I'll blow. I'll blow up, and it's easier for me to start small because I only have limited amount of space. Yeah. I need to focus on exactly what I need to display. Being efficient with the space, and get very efficient. Yeah. And then once I blow up, once I have, I go on to design for the desktop, yeah. uh, ten twenty four pixels. Then I have all this real estate. Then I can figure out. Okay, I have all my important things. Now, wh what else can I add? Yeah. When, when I blow up, right. And we have a couple of questions, so let's answer these questions. Yes, yeah, definitely. So right we can get to these. Um, so, when you're designing things, Daniel asks, "Do you have to allow for all the ads in a design?" That's good thinking. It's yeah. really good, actually. Yeah, yeah. it's really good. Good thinking. <laughs> Monetization is important, uh, and yeah, thinking about where you want to place ads is important. Um, you don't want to have it. You don't want to have pop-ups. What is this? 1998. You don't want to yeah. have banner ads that flash at you. Um, you want to think about ways to incorporate ads so that it's unobtrusive but still useful. Um, so yeah, when you're boxing things out, maybe have a box for an ad and just put it on the top right so it's still focal but not the main focus of your site. Uh, so yeah, think about think about ads. Think about monetization. Um, and, I'm using this word. Monetization is just sort of like how are you going to make money from your site? Basically, yeah. If you're if you're, let's say a blog, right? Yeah. You're a blogger. You want to make some money off your hard-earned work. Well, the ads is actually a very viable option. Yeah, definitely for like a blogger. Mm -hmm. And you know you don't have to sell out. You know you can link to maybe uh, something that's related to your blog. Like if you're doing a blog about travel, maybe you can link to something that some company that makes uh, like travel accessories. Maybe help your readers out. Be like, oh yeah, when I was traveling, I used this cool uh, keychain that lets me charge my iPhone. Um, shout out. <laughs> uh, okay, so we have another question here um, from Cam, and they ask, is a full stack developer job scope? mean that the person will cover both front-end and back-end job tasks? If it is, does it mean that the full-stack developer logically should be more well-paid uh, than the front-end, back-end alone? Actually, I was thinking about this when, when you asked that mm -hmm. question earlier. Um, and uh, that's, that's still a really difficult question to answer. It's still a little difficult, because a full-stack developer can never be as good as a, a, a front-end who is just concentrating and focus on the front-end. And a backend person like who's just a wizard in database administration and linking setting things up, 
you can never be as good as that. Yeah. So again, it comes down to the variability of what does the company need now and how good are you? And if you could, you could say like, I could be a full stack developer that is amazing at front and back, which, which is, it's, we call them, we start calling them unicorns a little bit. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, it's, it's a little bit, yeah, it's, it's hard for a reason. And if you feel like that, your skills can you know, often exceed a, a full front end person versus and a full back end person, then yeah, like, yeah, it's, go for it. Go for it. You, yeah. You'll get paid more. But then that depends on your own skill level and your own experience, not necessarily you being a full stack developer. So they're like, I have, I do not have any statistics to back up my claim. That's true. Yeah. I, I do not have any numbers to tell you, but you can, you, know, you can probably find it on the, say, US Census, if you want to get more granular information. Glassdoor, probably. Glassdoor. will probably give you. Uh, I'll say census. census. I'll say census, like the Does government. they have like a spot for front end developers? They have software developers, so then right. like, I, I hope they have like, they, they bucket that out to back end, mm -hmm. full stack. But I would say census is more statistically relevant. That's true. Versus Glassdoor, where you can you're just pick you're just cherry picking. That's true. Like a lot of your um, posts and articles that you're reading off. So again, it's hard. It still depends. So like if you have further um, questions on full stack, we we actually had a webcast on yeah. full stack yeah, uh, last week. So I take a look at that. I highly suggest you take a look at that. And if you have, still have further questions on that sort of stuff, we can definitely post your uh, questions on the forum and we'll. We'll find a full stack coach who, who is more, uh, who can um, get you the, the resources and inf information that you need. Cool. Uh, we have a couple more questions. You want to move on, or should we address these quick? Let's move on a little bit. Okay. We'll come back to the questions in a little bit. Yeah. All right. So that's the front end. So again, take away from the front end. We have design, and we have frameworks. So when you think about your front end, think about design first. How are you going to lay out everything, and how you know from a general picture, a bigger level, how does everything, uh, how will everything look? How do you plan on everything looking out? Because then you can then figure out the technology, the frameworks that can help you um, drive that design. Now let's mo let's move on to the back end. And if you're going to walk away from uh, the back end, one uh, lesson that or one thing that we should all uh, walk away with is this crucial question. Will our content be static or dynamic? What does that mean? Static, dynamic. And static is just the information will not change, depending on any user. Like, I just want to you know, write, um, yeah, just write a blog, yeah. write an article. That article will never change. You may, of course, you may edit, proof it, add some addendums to it, but for the most part, it will not change much throughout the life of that blog or the life of that article. Mm -hmm. So do you need technology? Do you need uh, programming um, uh, interfaces, uh, servers to actually change that article depending on whatever inputs, whatever factors? You Probably not because you write an article, it's static. It doesn't change. It's not dynamic. So if if all of your content will indeed be static, then that makes the the next questions a whole lot easier to answer. Yeah. Because these questions will involve in how uh, how much horsepower and how much um, dynamic interactivity interactivity yeah. that you need from the back end. Because but again, if it's static. You, you could just literally write your code in HTML and then just find a simple web, web host yeah. to actually host that server. You know, host your files on a server, and then you're done. That You don't need any other um, uh, support technology. Now, if the question is dynamic, then that will actually help drive us further on what, how much uh, dynamic um, power do we need. Yeah. So let's move on. So. That's the first crucial question. Is it, comp is it static or dynamic? Because basically, we're going to uh, talk about three things now. Uh, let me look at my notes. Basically, we're, talk about, we're, going, to, we're going to talk about server hosting. You know, what, what is, where can we find a server that could host our web pages? And there's tons of them. And should we 
you know, what type of uh, hosting is there is providing. And the type of services, the type of dynamic services, or even static services that we need, like does our backend server need to um, put in an, an accept API requests, or does the backend server need to host a database as well, access some data for a user, and then give it to that user? Example, um, a banking website. I tell you right now, a banking website has a very, very powerful backend server. Yeah. Because guess what? There's a lot of money involved. It it has to like access very secure databases to access your money, and it has a ton of services for you to be able to go ahead ahead and change your address, do a do a wire transfer, uh, withdraw some money, deposit some money, add in a check, schedule uh, recurring charges. That's that's a lot of services, yeah. and that requires a um, backend technology that. I, that has to be very secure. It has to be very robust. It has to be secure. It also, it has to be easily usable. Exactly. Oh, it's for, for the back end. Also, right. for the front end yeah. people. So basically, usually, you have a front end person who takes care of all the front end stuff. And then he or she will talk with the back end person who takes care of all the databases. And they talk with, with another and say, hey, uh, what's your API endpoint? And I need some documentation of when I send off my um, Ajax request, send off my requests on my front end to be able to get the data I need for. For what I need to do, so there's constant communication between the front end and the back end person. If the if that person is not like a full stack person who's doing both, and the third thing I'm gonna be talking about is the technology stack. And this is a very I'll say it's it's, it's important thing to understand. It's also an important thing to understand the the vocabulary and the lingo of when when we're talking with other web developers. Okay, so server hosting. There's three. Categories of uh, hosting. One I call this easy hosting. This is a combination of free hosting and shared hosting. Now let me backtrack and let's let's define what hosting is. Yeah. Hosting is basically I have I create my web page on my own local computer, but now I want to be able to go ahead and upload my files so everyone else can access can access on the internet. Usually, it's a big pain if you want to do it ourselves. If we want to hook up our own local server in our own house to serve, which you can still do that, but yeah. then it's it's I, we we don't recommend it because that's more for advanced uh, person user to actually set up their own hosting. Also, more prone to error and like rainstorms. <laughs> rainstorms, your you know cable shuts off. Well, then your 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 um or your computer um. Your computer shuts down. Well, then guess what? Your server, uh, no one will be able to access your website. And yeah. if you're, if you want to make some money off your website, it's good to actually um, host this out and find a host to actually you pay them because you pay them a, a fee, a nominal fee, for them to take care of the servers. If the servers go down, they have someone twenty four. They always have someone uh, 24 seven, 365 days a week to make sure that the servers are always. Running, yeah, and they also have the bandwidth that that you need because basically your own little uh, uh, internet uh, provider in your, in your house won't be enough to say serve thousands of people, yeah, who may be, who may be accessing your website. So that's the advantages of the hosting. So basically, recommend find hosts. Yeah. So actually, somebody had a question about that. Yeah, which we just answered. It was great. And there are some there are some. I feel like there's some places where you can host for free, aren't there? Yeah, post for free, but then they force you to either host their own ads. Ads, right, right. So mm -hmm. you have ad supported hosting. Yeah, so ad supported hosting. So like the ads that you don't necessarily want them to show, well, tough luck, because they'll they'll force you to yeah. host those ads instead of you paying. And I recommend you just go ahead and pay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, pay them if you want a more streamlined user experience. Now, there's like, yeah, like there's some great smaller hosting sites. We'll go into that later. But um, Squarespace, I think, yeah, is free. Good. Like, oh, Squarespace. I don't know if they're free. Is it, is it free? I don't think so. Okay, for sure. GitHub is free. GitHub is free. Yes. Yeah, the GitHub <laughs> IO page is free. Yeah, that is completely free for developers, and if you just want to host your own website, and if it's static, perfect. Yeah, I I actually personally will do that myself. 
if I were to just host static web pages, I don't need to do any any I don't need any backend support. Yeah, I'll just go to GitHub. Cool. Pu you know, push my changes, and there we go. So yeah. that's easy hosting, and that's really good for static web pages. Now, once you level up, let's say let's let's we let's assume that we need some more. Um, Technology to host. Let's say we want to create a forum post, or like like a forum page, yeah. like Reddit or any other forums. Or you'd ask the discussion forums. You'd ask the discussion forums. Yeah. Or even let's say a banking website, right? Yeah. You're, you're going to need some more horsepower. You're going to need to actually have access to the server itself and actually install and set up all the software that's needed to actually host the server. Yeah. And host the web pages, like virtual private server or a dedicated hosting site. This is actually for people. People, these are people's uh, full-time jobs, like these Linux administrators and these uh, people who actually set up things for other people. And mm -hmm. th this can be a, a full-time job for a lot yeah. of people. And if if you're if you feel like you want to get into this space and learn how to do that, then by all means, I encourage you. And yeah, just there's tons of uh, tutorials out there to learn how to set up your own, set up a server, like a web server, like using Apache and setting that up in Linux. Cool. But yeah, basically, that's the second tier. And if you, this is the caveat. You need to set up everything yourself. All they give yeah. you is just a server, a box, somewhere in, in the world. Arizona. Arizona, Arizona. New York, wherever. Yeah. That server, and you have, root, you have root access. You have access to that server 24-7 remotely. And you'll be able to um, type in a lot of Basically, a lot of terminal commands to be able to actually set up the server. You FTP, you upload your files to the server, and just you set up everything. And that, that of course, that costs more money because yeah. you are basically renting uh, a server, a whole computer too, by chance. And this actually, if you're having more than a couple of thousand people, yeah, that's when you start needing some more horsepower yeah. to actually serve. And then third. This is called platform as a service. This is actually a combination of easy hosting and also dedicated, uh, uh, I'll say, virtual private server mm -hmm. hosting. And if you're a programmer, you're a developer, and you want to be able to, like, say, you know, create a forum or create a, a banking website, you need some uh, backend support that actually handles all the database requests. Well, then it means that you can either set up set things up yourself, or actually just use a platform as a service where they actually tell you, OK, we're going to set up everything for you. All you need to do is just upload your code. Mm -hmm. This is Google App Engine. So for the people who are at, at in stage four, what you're using is called a platform as a service oh, cool. hosting. And that's that's called, yeah, that's that's hosting. You're, you host it, and yet for like one day, you have like basically, I think, a gigabyte worth of free bandwidth. Anything else, and they'll start charging you. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so like it's it's free to to just play around, and use f f for the first yeah for the first few thousand yeah. people who will access it. It will be free, and that's a platform as a service. Where you just upload your Python code, your backend code, which we'll talk about next in our backend technology. They take care of all the server setup. You don't need to even touch uh, a terminal. They take care of all the database setup, and they take care of all the redundancy, the redundancies that's needed. All you need, to, yeah. All you need really to do nice. is yeah. upload your code, focus on developing your application, and then that's it. You pay them a nominal fee, and if should you blow up, that's great. You just scale up. You just yeah. scale up, and you know, hopefully, if you scale up, you'll make more money, and then you'll be able to pay off more, uh, more of the server costs. Great that's way needed. to bootstrap. Yeah, great. So that's server hosting. So depends on again. The question of is it static? Is it dynamic content? And what level of dynamic content do I need, really need? What level of horsepower do I need for my website? Marco, before we move on, could we yeah. ask to answer a couple of questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so one question about the uh, nano degree itself: Is this certifications in this, or just experience only? For for what we're talking about. Uh, yes. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I think what is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is I think this? I think um, he is talking about uh, front end and back end oh. development. So you that's what uh, there is. There are two nano degrees called the front end nano degree, and then the full stack nano degree that actually 
uh, you'll dive into detail of how to develop the front end and the back and end. The back end, yeah. So yeah, I really suggest you just you if you're more interested, investigate the full stack and the front end now degree to be able to get a to figure out how sh you should do this now. Yeah. All this how stuff because what we're telling you is what and why. What we're not gonna cover is the how, and that 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 takes a that's whole the degree. That's the degree. <laughs> that takes the, that's the whole certification yeah, process degree, so. for you to take. So hopefully yeah. that will help guide you. Yeah, too. and as far as getting experience, um, you can do it sort of on your own. Start building websites. That's really the best way to gain experience without being in a job. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's see who else. A um, couple more questions on the framework. Is Ruby on Rails considered a front end or back end tool? Select that. Ruby on Rails is a back end tool. It serves websites, but it it doesn't handle the HTML, the actual designing of the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It just it's basically like your Python that you're learning in stage four to serve your websites. Mm, cool stuff. Yeah, Ruby is the programming language, and Rails is the framework. Uh, okay, I get. And yeah, Web I, App Two is your framework that we we're using in Python. Interesting. Actually, I know that. Um, Okay. Uh, as far as the ads go, yes, the sites have ads everywhere because they want to make a lot of money. So it's it just depends on how much how many ads you want to put on your page correlates to how much money you're going to make off of them. Um, so and also the user experience too. User like, experience, yeah. Like how much of a, how, like how say my my question is how well do you want the user experience to be? And I understand the ads are necessary if you want to make some money. It's yeah. just that you can you can still be smart about it. You can still try to integrate those ads into yeah. your website. And then, uh, as far as like ads that the hosting company puts on your web page, you have less control over how many go on. Um, and it depends on the hosting company as to whether you can control where to put those ads. Uh, but then again, it just it just depends. Um, mm -hmm. Good questions. Yeah. There's a lot of a lot good of, questions. A lot of really practical yeah. questions. Um, so Conroy asks, does the use of frameworks reduce the need to know the DOM like the back of your palm? Yes. Um, so mapping everything out is is a way to reduce memorizing everything. It's so you have everything on one page. You can refer to this when you're going through and building your website. You're like, okay. I'm going to start with my topmost div, and like this is that box. And then I'm going to start with the header div, and that's this box. So when you go back to it, too, you can be like, oh, this is this div within that div, and then you can find it in your code. And you don't have to memorize things or dig really too deep, um, and it saves a lot of time. So great question. Yeah, though I will say that don't let don't use a framework and don't depend on a framework so much that it will become a crux. Mm. I tell you right now. Um, if a lot of a lot of people say they know, say the front end stuff, I've heard this over talks with when we're talking with Mike and other front front end people. A lot of people say they know jQuery, but they they, they don't know JavaScript. That should be reversed, actually. Interesting. If they say if you study enough J jQuery, you could basically do a lot of stuff with jQuery. But then, if the need arises that this framework doesn't quite do what you uh, what it can do, because yeah. it's just a framework. It's just a way for you to do things in some sort of idealized environment. Yeah. You have to resort to actual learning JavaScript, knowing the actual JavaScript, mm. and knowing how to access the DOM in JavaScript, and know how to access those nodes. So I would say, yeah, it does reduce the need for you to know the DOM or the document object model, like the back of your hand. And you know, highly recommend. I use frameworks all the time for myself, but you should not um, depend on it uh, too much, or else it will be a crux. And if you're trying to find a job in front end or back end uh, web developer, they expect you to know the um, the DOM, and they expect you to know how to manipulate the DOM using just plain straight JavaScript, straight JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. Yeah. Good point. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Let's move on. Let's move on. So, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is oh, services. Basically, this is basically like once we've chosen our host, our type of host, we need to figure out what is it exactly that we need to do. What's this, what's the service? When I say service, I mean what is it that the the backend server 
supposed to uh, take in from the front end? And what is it supposed to output? If there's a running theme in this uh, intro to programming now degree, it, it is what's, you always need to ask the question, what's the input and what's the output? Mm. What's the input to the server? Like, what are the, what's the type of inf information that our backend server is getting from the front end? OK, this is the type of information I need. Let's say, let's um, draw this down, let's say a banking website. Mm. I need to know your account information. I need to know your login information. I need to know um, uh, how much money do you want to transfer. All those little inputs. And then at the output, OK, what, what's my output? What, what am I producing? What am I trying to do? Say, let's say for a banking website, for my output, I need to, I most likely need to access some sort of database to change that account balance. If someone needs to give me an input, uh, withdraw or deposit $200, I need to basically process uh, when, when a person logs into my website, I need to process their password and compare it to a, a database, uh, a password database, and make sure that it's correct. If it's correct, then Give, let them uh, log in, you know, send them a, a validated cookie, and then they'll be able to log in. So those are the thing, big things that you need to uh, consider. And what are your big services that your back end is trying to do? Again, if, you're, if your back end is just serving static web pages, then that's really the one service, just serving the web page. Like the input is a request from the browser, and the output is just, it will just send you the HTML code. That's that's your that's your input and output for your backend for a static web page. Now, dynamics. There's a lot of things that's happening, and then you you're gonna need uh, programming language to actually help process the inputs and outputs, which is actually next thing is called the technology stack. Mm. So we have three things in the technology stack. So the first thing is some people have mentioned programming languages. What is the program language like that we want to use? What's the, what's what's that basic technology? Yeah. You're learning Python in stage four, and that's your that's your core stack. That's your core technology that you'll be using to process inputs and outputs. <laughs> but then there's a lot of other programming languages that other people use too, called Java, .NET, Ruby, Node.js, PHP. It's a lot of people, or I'll say PHP, ASP, and PHP is actually really old. Yeah, it's throwback. I mean, throwback, it's like, but it's it's actually uh, it's a server side technology. You run code on your server, and then it spits out the HTML. So again, what's your step? What's your programming language? What's once you figure out that out, you could then figure out okay, depending on my my, my services, what's my database? There are two schools of there are two big uh, types of databases right now that you should really just need to. Think about is called relational databases. MySQL, Postgres SQL, that's um, that's a common, those are two free databases that you can install in your server and use. And then there's um other uh, non-relational databases called NoSQL, MongoDB, Hadoop, Cassandra, those are uh, the other type of databases that do not um, depend on uh, putting your data into you know a traditional spreadsheet like table mm -hmm. and based on your experience and based on what what you need you may choose let's say a mongodb uh server because you don't you just want to um, read things really fast and you just want to be able to go ahead and um just put if just store information like like an object like then that's what we're using in Stage four, Google's data store. It's it's a no it's a no SQL type of database, versus a more relational database. And now relational databases they're they're, they're old school. They're they are they are older and but they're they're very reliable, mm -hmm. and they're very normalized. Meaning that they actually if you organize your data very well, it works very well, and it's you know it's the performance is decent as well. Mm -hmm. Though you know once you scale up, relational databases start uh, hitting hitting a wall. And especially if you try, try to do joins in your tables, it's it gets uh, it gets really slow if you're trying to do outer joins, inner joins, or anything like that. Like off like a two million record uh, database, things start yeah. slowing down. So I would say, yeah, depends on what you're familiar with and what type of database system that you want, and you know, like how are you going to scale up? It's you may even use a combination. 
one part I'm going to use um, NoSQL MongoDB to host my uh, user accounts. And then another part, relational, I'm going to use that to store in my uh, the rest of the information I have about my users. So it really depends. There's both trade-offs on relational and NoSQL database. And then the next is server operating system. Now, this is, um, this is really what you're familiar with. A lot of servers are operate on Linux, but there's a sizable number of, number of servers that operate on Windows. And why should you care? Well, it, it just makes it uh, apparent that you, you need to know the type of technology that you can work with. Like, say, if it's a Linux, then expect to work a lot in the terminal, in the command prompt. And, but with Linux, you have a lot of free software that you could just install on your computer and run with it. Versus Windows, most likely you're going to use a, a software, a Windows software called IIS, or it's all proprietary, which is part of part of like Internet, um, if what, Internet Information Server. It's called Microsoft IIS. I forgot the uh, acronym, uh, the what it stands for, but yeah, it's all proprietary. Is it INS? I think it's IIS. IIS, okay. IIS, could look up, yeah. look that up, and update our, our our notes. But yeah, it's all proprietary. Other servers, uh, Oracle, you know, HP, Dell, they may have their own special system. But again, it depends on how much you're familiar with uh, your server and how flexible do you want your server to be. So. We're about the end of our um, little presentation here, so let's uh, let's just have a little summer here. So, John, just let's just can you just summarize the yeah, final absolutely. little so, bit? Yeah, yeah. We covered uh, the big ideas in design about making a website look good and work well, which is laying out all the boxes that you have either on paper or some sort of graphics program in your computer. Uh, we laid out the user interface, so. Where do you want the users to log in? Where do you want the users to post comments? We talked about which boxes you want to put those in and what sort of um, technologies you want to connect to those. And then we also talked a little bit about graphics, about whether you want to design things in-house, outsource them. Um, and if you do decide to design them in-house, what sort of things you want to think about as far as uh, ease of looking at it? Uh, like in terms of contrast and how to lay that out in your uh, in your sketch and wireframe. We also covered JavaScript and CSS frameworks. And these are sort of pre-bundled software that you can use to help your development move faster um, and work better uh, and work with a lot more uh, capabilities than you probably even knew existed. Um, and that sort of wrapped up all the things that you want to think about when you're planning the front end side of your web page. And then we sort of transitioned into back end. Here. Yeah, so three things that you need to know about the back end. How are you going to host um, your content? Is your content static or dynamic? That will really drive your the rest of your decisions on trying to figure out the back end part of your uh, website. The type of services. Uh, what, do you need a database? Do you need to have API endpoints? Do you need to have user accounts? Like allow to allow people to log in. Do you, do you need all that? What type of like things that will the server uh, actually do? And then last is the technology stack. Really, you know, what are the programming languages? What are the frameworks that you're going to use? What type of database system will you use? And also, what type of uh, environment, server uh, operating system environment will you use? Because a lot of people will, a lot of developers will actually ask you. So, what's your tech? What's your stack? What's your technology stack? And um, I'll give you an example. A classic stack is called LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. So I'm using Linux. I'm using uh, Apache. Apache is the software that actually uh, on the server uh, actually serves the yeah. the website. I'm using MySQL. That's my database. I'm using PHP. Is my uh, my programming language. Uh, a lot of people could say, "Oh, Perl. You could use Perl. You could use, also use Python too, oh, Perl, as as your as your uh, tech stack as well." Mm -hmm. Another tech stack is Meme, Mongo uh, Database Express Framework, Angular JS, and and is uh, Node.js. No, yeah. Node.js is your backend. It's actually written in JavaScript, so you're using JavaScript to actually serve your web pages as well. In addition to actually using JavaScript to. <laughs> um, Manipulate your web pages on 
actually, at the front end. Uh, talking about manipulating web pages, yeah. um, there was a question actually about what that means to manipulate the DOM through JavaScript. Right. So the DOM is basically it's called the dog of the object model, and it's basically you could think about uh, as a tree, right? It's like a it's, it's like an abstract tree where you have elements belonging to other elements in your HTML. And if you think about it, you without JavaScript, there is no way for you to manipulate the DOM or change the DOM live. Yeah. The only way for you it the only way for you to say change the relationship or change like say change one, like say add in a paragraph, right? into a division, there is no way for you to do that without actually having to open up your um, editor, edit the HTML code, and then reload the web page. Yeah, can't do that every single time. You can't do that every single time, especially for a user. But like, let's say that you want to program something interactive, or you want to dynamically add in a paragraph in the website, you will use JavaScript to actually manipulate the DOM to make sure you, know, you manipulate it and you actually add in a paragraph inside uh, the website itself live. So when the person loads up your um, web page, they may not have that paragraph uh, inserted. But then, if they do, if they click a button, then the button will actually launch a JavaScript function that will actually go ahead and insert a paragraph element inside our some sort of a div element or container element. So that's what we, what we uh, mean when we say manipulate the DOM. Yeah, that's great. great. This is a really nice diagram. You know, it really sort of pulls together yeah. everything that you need to think about when planning a website. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So again, these notes uh, will be posted hopefully by tonight or tomorrow. So they will be posted on the discussion forum. So please just log on to the discussion forums and look at the categories and then look, at, look for the office hour um, notes. Um, category, and you'll be able to go ahead and look at our notes, you know, highlight them, read them, reflect on them, digest them, and then yeah, if you have any further questions on whatever we presented today, yeah, please post them in the discussion forums. Thank you very much for your time. Right. Thanks so much for coming. All right, thank you. Take Bye. Care. Bye.